This is our third One Factor Nova video, and in particular, this one is mostly about transformations. So to recap, we have this problem that the type 1 error rate gets really high if we're comparing multiple means. We solve this problem with the ANOVA. Conceptually, we're comparing the means. Formally, we're comparing variances. Our procedure, we calculate sums of squares, mean sums, into an F-test. We either accept the null hypothesis and the means don't appear to differ, or we reject and one or more different. And then we figure out which ones are different with either Bonferroni corrected t-tests or Tukey-Kramer comparison intervals. But to return to this slide from earlier, we can only do the ANOVA if all the variances are equal, right? If we have one group, like this medium gray one here, that has this gigantic sum of squares within, it will inflate the overall mean sums within and cause us to miss genuine differences between groups. Right? If we have one variance that's much higher, it will actually cause us to make a type 2 error and miss genuine differences. So this is the reason why the ANOVA is a homoscedastic test. This is just that same kind of point illustrated with a cartoon. Right, This individual here has a much, much larger variance, and so he can't be trusted. Okay, so remember this, this is the Fmax test. This is what we would do to figure out if the variances were equal. Um, it's related to the F test, which we've done before. Very similar test statistic. If we reject the null hypothesis, however, can't do the ANOVA. And I said we had to transform our data in order to equalize variances. What does that mean and how does that work? So if our data do not fit the assumptions of our statistical technique, we can transform it into a data set that does. And I should point out, this is not just the ANOVA. This is not just a method used for different variances in the ANOVA. It's used for a variety of things. Anyway, so we're going to transform our data, and then we're going to do our statistical test on the transformed values. So our formal conclusion may differ, right? So for example, if we're looking for a relationship between things, we might find that there's a relationship between the log base 10 of those things instead of the x, y directly. But the biological interpretation would often be the same, right? If there's a relationship between the log base 10 of x and the log base 10 of y, then it means there's some sort of relationship between x and y. Similarly, if there's the difference between the mean of the log base 10 of one group and the mean of the log base 10 of another group, then there's some sort of difference between the means of those groups. So this is not cheating as long as we're careful. First of all, we have to remember the formal conclusion is restricted to the transformed data. Any confidence intervals or whatever that we calculate, that's only for the transformed data. And then if we use our results to make predictions, that's only gonna make predictions for the transformed values. If we wanna go back to the original values, we got to reverse transform our data in some way to get back to the originals. So when would we do these transformations? In general, when an assumption of our statistical procedure is violated. So for example, equal variances for the homoscedastic t-test. If we really, really wanted to do a homoscedastic t-test, but our f-test showed that the variances were different, we could transform the data to get data sets that are equal variances and then do a homoscedastic t-test. If we wanted to use this 66, 95, 99 stuff from the normal distribution to interpret standard deviations, but our data was not normally distributed, we could use a transformation to turn it into a distribution that is normally distributed. Similarly, the f-test required a normal distribution. And actually the t-test requires that the data be normally distributed as well. However, this assumption is pretty weak if we have a large sample size. The reason that we're kind of thinking about this now is equal variances are a requirement for the ANOVA techniques, and actually so is a normal distribution from the ANOVA techniques. But again, if we have a large sample size, we usually don't have to worry about that one. And then we haven't gotten it to it yet, but for the correlation and regression studies, we need linear data, normal distributions, and equal variances. So transformations are used in a variety of circumstances because there's a whole bunch of different situations where the assumptions behind our statistical tests might be violated, and we may then need to transform our data into new data that doesn't violate those assumptions.
So what kinds of transformations are valid? So any transformation is valid if it preserves the relative order of data values. So if you have three values, A, B, and C, and they're transformed, if B is in between A and C, then the transformed value of B has to be between the transformed value of A and the transformed value of C. Now the kind of smallest to largest can reverse, right? Because A can be smaller than B is smaller than C. And it could be that the transform value of A is larger than the transform value of B, but then that would have to be larger than the transform value of C, right? So that the relative order is still preserved. Second, they have to be continuous. There can't be any gaps or values that can't be transformed. And then third, the values have to be, or the transformations have to be invertible or reversible. Right. Once you go to some transform values, you have to be able to get back to the original values um, from that point. Generally, a definition of a transformation is given by a function. Right? So the transform value of x is f of x, and then we say what f is. So for example, we can imagine a transformation half plus 7, f of x is 1 half of x plus 7. Okay, does that preserve the order? If we had two different values, and say the first one was smaller than the second one, if we do this transformation, then the order is preserved, right? Because the transformed values are still in that same sequence. Is it continuous? Yes, there's no value that we can't plug into this equation and get some sort of resultant value. And then is it reversible? Well, yeah, so if you have some transformed value, all you need to do is subtract seven and then multiply by two, and that gets you back to the original value. So a transformation like that would fulfill our definition of a valid transformation that fulfills those requirements. So what kinds of transformations are commonly used? So here are five commonly used ones. The first is a log transformation. The purpose of the log transformation is it shrinks large ranges of values, right? So if you have a bunch of values from 15 to 1,000, taking the log base 10 would shrink them down into values from 1.18 to 3. And this is used quite often because the variance often increases with the mean and taking the log transformation will equalize variances when means are different. This transformation is called the arc sine square root transformation. You can take the square root of the value and then take the arc sine or inverse sine. This is often used for proportions because as you'll remember, the variance of proportions or frequencies is usually the highest at 0.5. This transformation equalizes variances across different proportions. The square root transformation is fairly commonly used if we have count data or data that might be Poisson distributed. It'll take that long right tail and bring it in to make things more normally distributed. This transformation here, where you're taking x, raising it to a power a minus 1 divided by a, it's kind of a totally unintuitive um, transformation, but it's commonly used. This is a box Cox transformation and used a lot in public health. And then finally, a reciprocal transformation is sometimes used as well. Um, so some of these transformations don't work very well if you have negative numbers. For example, this one doesn't work very well. But what you could always do is you could, if you have data with negative and positive values, you can always add a constant to make everything positive and then do one of these things afterwards. Um, but sometimes this is optional. Um, however, for this, right, you can't take logs of negative number, numbers. And transformations are everywhere. You're already familiar with a number of these. For example, we live in LA and we think about earthquakes and the Richter scale is actually a log scale. Each of these is 10 times stronger than the previous one, right? So a six is 10 times stronger than a five, a seven is 10 times stronger than a six, and a seven is actually 100 times stronger than a five. Decibels work the same way. Every 10 decibels is 10 louder than the previous. So 100 decibels is 100 times louder than 80, not just a quarter larger. Musical notes also work the same way. If you're a musician, you probably didn't think about this, but the entire musical scale is 12 notes and that actually doubles the hertz and they're multiplicative. So in fact, each one of these 12 notes is the 12th root of two times more hertz than the previous one. It's not an additive scale. It's a essentially a multiplicative of a 12th root scale. Now, one thing to 
be aware of is that transforming data is actually really common. So we're not going to do it much in this class, and you may think it's kind of a small topic, but in fact it's extremely common. And some people actually transform their data before they even look at it to figure out if it satisfies the assumptions because they're just kind of thinking, oh, well, everybody uses a box Cox transformation. Let me just do that. And in fact, they didn't need to quite often if their data did fulfill the assumptions of their statistical test. But this is very common, um, so we need to be familiar with it. Here's an example. So let's think about a problem. If the variances are not equal, we can't do an ANOVA, which would be a problem. What would our solution be to mathematically transform the values into new ones that have equal variances? So here's a scenario. Here's three data sets, and I would like to compare them to see if their means are different from each other. So my preliminary step is going to be an fmax test. If I take these five values, they have this variance. These five values have this variance. These five values have this variance. And to do an fmax test, I take the largest one and divide it by the smallest one. So 8.5 divided by 0.5 gives me 17. My critical value for this fmax test, when I go and look at the critical values for three groups, each of which has four degrees of freedom, the critical value is 15.5. So a 17 is larger than a 15.5. I would reject my null hypothesis of equal variances, and I can't do an ANOVA, and there's no good alternative. So instead, what I'm going to think about doing is a square root transformation to this data. Now the data here shown is the square root transform values. So the 4 became a 2, the 5 became a 2.236, etc., all the way through to the 11 becoming a 3.317. Note when you do a transformation, you have to transform all the values into all the values. You can't just do something like, oh, let me just transform these and then compare this and this and this. It's all or nothing. Okay, so now if I look at my transformed values, what do I get? These are my variances. Take the largest one, divide it by the smallest one, I would get 13.28. That is now less than the critical value, so now I can assume that the variances in my population of square rooted values are equal, and I could do an ANOVA. Right? So with the original data here, I can't do the ANOVA, with my transform data here, I can do the ANOVA. And if you go and you're looking online at the handouts and the examples, um, handout 13, the self-test number two, shows an example of this, right? I created data sets that actually failed the initial FMAX test, so they had to be transformed and then FMAX tested again before they would pass and then be able to continue for the rest of the ANOVA. Okay, to recap, we have this problem. That's why we're doing the ANOVA. Here are our conceptual hypotheses. Here are our formal hypotheses. This is what we calculate. These are our results. How do we figure out what's different? Von Fernie corrected t-test or 2 Kramer comparison intervals. And then in here, at the very beginning, actually I guess here for our procedure, this is where we do our fmax test to make sure that the variances are all equal because the ANOVA is a homoscedastic technique.